But we're already prepared for that, right? Amen. Genesis chapter 6, verse number 1. And it came to pass when men began to multiply on the face of the earth, and daughters were born unto them, that the sons of God saw the daughters of men that they were fair, and they took them wives of all which they chose. And the Lord said, My spirit shall not always strive with man, for that he also is flesh, yet his days shall be a hundred and twenty years. There were giants in the earth in those days, and also after that. When the sons of God came in unto the daughters of men, and they bare children of them, the same became mighty men, which were of old, men of renown. And God saw that the wickedness of man was great in the earth, and that every imagination of the thoughts of his heart were only evil continually. Was only evil continually. And it repented the Lord that he had made man on the earth, and it grieved him at his heart. I preached a sermon a few years back called When God Grieves and Jesus Weeps. And, uh, you know, it, it's a powerful thing when the scriptures say that, that, that it grieved God that he had created man on the earth. Whew. Think about how powerful that is, that statement, how absolutely powerful that statement is. And that, by the way, that God grieves, also that we know, right? The Holy Spirit is God, and the Bible says, Grieve not the Holy Spirit of God, whereby ye are sealed on the day of redemption. Let me tell you something um, about that, and that's not what we're really covering today. But if you grieve the Holy Ghost of God, don't expect things to be over in like, like a day. Don't expect, that's not a thing where, that's not a thing where, where you ask for forgiveness, and, and, and yes, you're forgiven. Don't, don't misunderstand what I'm saying. But that doesn't mean there's not consequences for that. That doesn't mean that that's not going to take time to heal that grief. Um, you know, David spent years in his situation because he grieved the Holy Spirit. You know, he grieved the Lord. Um, Josh, or, uh, you know, uh, let's see, not, uh, David did that. Uh, another man that did that, uh, well, Paul warns about that. He, he warns to grieve not the Holy Spirit of God. There are others that, that grieve the Spirit of God, and that relationship was not completely, that, that, that fellowship was not completely there for a while. God says in the Old Testament over and over again, and you know, Paul reiterates that in the New Testament, that that relationship does not, that, that does not, come back, the relationship is still there, but that fellowship and that sweetness, it does not always come back right away. So sometimes you may wonder why you're harder and, and uh, your Bible and your, and your time. Well, if you've grieved the Holy Ghost, there's a time where, that's, where God says that his spirit is grieved with him. And that God's not going to, you're not going to have that sweet joy and that fellowship that you maybe once had right away. That may take some time. Right? To heal that breach that is there. That God, that's one of the reasons why God allows that desertion and different things to happen to us where He doesn't allow us to feel His comfortable presence, right? Where, where, where sometimes you don't even feel that you're saved, even. That, that is from grieving the Spirit of God. Right? And that, that, that sometimes takes time. And you've got to find out why and how that was done. Well, the Bible tells us here how that happened, right? You need to pay close attention to that. You know what a lot of people do? The first thing they do is they say, well, I must not be saved. That must be what it is. That's the first place they go to. Now, that's an easy way out, and you can make another profession of faith, and you can do that a thousand times your whole life if you want to. But that ain't going to change the fact that you grieve the Holy Ghost of God after you were saved, and God's dealing with you. You don't, you don't need to make a thousand professions of faith. You just need to believe God. Amen. You need to believe what Jesus said in his word. Amen. That's just scripture, and I wasn't planning on talking about that, but God knew it, so that's okay. Let's pray. Father in heaven, Lord, help us as we dig into the scriptures here today, and as we learn what your word says and the importance of these issues. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. So the question that we come to is, who were the sons of God? You know, who were they? Well, first of all, I want to illustrate, you know, I want to show you today, they were, there was no godly line of Seth. That, is taught, that, that people have this mythical godly line of Seth that they talk about. The Bible says that Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord, right? That's what the Bible says. It doesn't say that there's this godly line of Seth and all of them found grace in the eyes of the Lord and all of them were pure in their generations. Because remember, these people had other children. They didn't just have like one child. It talks about the Methuselah and Enoch. They didn't have just one child. They had many children that followed that line. 
right? But the firstborn were mentioned. Always. But the Bible says that, but Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. It doesn't say that Seth's entire line did or the God, that godly line did, as if men try to teach about that. I believe that, these, that, that they were indeed fallen angels, that these, were the, these sons of God were fallen angels, that the Bible teaches this throughout the scriptures. And I'm going to show you that today. We'll, we'll cover most of the Old Testament and we'll see how far, and, and the New Testament today. We'll cover some of that and then we'll cover into their crimes and the judgment of God upon them. And we'll look at all those things, which, by the way, they still have an application for you and I. Uh, that the Bible teaches us throughout that this, ex that, that this explains the origin of the giants. See, one of the problems with modern day teachings about this are, is, is they never explain to you where the giants came from. They never explain why they're always evil. They never explain why they always hate God. They never explain any of those things. But they say, well, it's the godly line of Seth. And, you know, we've kind of talked about that. Well, here's what we're not going to do. We're not going to use the book of Enoch, okay? That's what we're not going to do. You're not, I'm not going to say, turn to the book of Enoch here, and uh, I, I'm not going to do that. We're not going to use spurious accounts, historical accounts of giants and, and, and sons of God and, and all those other things. I, I may do a supplemental teaching, like I said online on Tuesday, about some mythical accounts, just to show you that people have talked about this, and there's nothing wrong with doing that. We're going to use the Bible. We're going to use the scriptures, right? Uh, we're not going to use mythological tales. We're not going to go through that and, and, and show you all those to try to prove our point. We're going to strictly use the scriptures all the way through because that's where, the, that's where the power is. That's where the authority is. That's why I stand up before you today is on the authority of scripture. Amen? So that's what we're going to use. And we're not going to use the Hebrew or the Greek because I don't know either one of those. So I couldn't help you with that. It would be really bad if I tried to preach to Paul in Hebrew, right? And, uh, or, you know... Preach to Brother Scott in Greek, right? It wouldn't probably wouldn't work out very well. So I'll just use the English, okay? And my broken English at that. Okay, you know, there, there are a lot of people that say there are missing books of the Bible, okay? They say, if you, if you notice here, that's uh, missing books of the Bible removed in the 19th century, right? So they, they try to tell you, and then they'll take their spurious accounts of the, the sons of God and the giants and all those things from these spurious books that are in history, and they try to do that. Uh, uh, the book of Enoch is, is so popular for people. When I first taught this years ago, I said it a thousand times, 10 years ago, 11 years ago now, I talked about the book of Enoch and I read some things out of there, not like it was scripture. I, I, I made that very plain and evident and clear. I was showing that there, but you know what? The more that I got attacked for that, the more I said, well, you know what? That's fine. I just won't use it. Um, and uh, I'll just teach you right from the Bible. And I did. And people still don't want to believe the Bible. So uh, <laughs> then that's nothing you can do about that. Uh, but also along, along with these missing books goes the theory uh, of the flat earth as key to decrypt the book of Enoch, right? The flat earth is, you know, I don't know if you know this, but the flat earth is the mystery that unlocks every, it's the key that unlocks every mystery known to man. If you, if you, know, the, if you know about the flat earth, you can unlock everything, right? You can, you can, I mean, it's just like a key that if you know about the flat earth, you know everything. I, it's amazing, isn't it? Open pickle jars and everything. Jars and everything. That's right. Yeah. Treasure chests will open up to you. And it, but what is the flat earth? It's a psyop to distract away from geocentricity. That's what the flat earth is. That's how Satan always works. Yep. He always takes things over the other way. That's why you and I have to walk the narrow way. Because it's very, it's, it's very easy for you and I to be caught up into something that is extra biblical, right? right. And that's, why do you think these flat earthers, they don't like to talk about geocentricity. They don't like to talk about it at all for the most part. And the reason why is because that's the true doctrine. And what does geocentricity lift up? Christ. It exalts Christ. That's what the doctrine of geocentricity does. Amen. So because it does that, uh, that's why, that's why uh, they hate it. But they would rather lift up. And they, by the way, most of these flat earthers, these people, they all like the book of Enoch. They absolutely love it. Right? So we, we went over these scriptures. We talked about these um, these, uh, these main scriptures, these, these scriptures have been argued about for years. Uh, there have always been two sides of that story. Some believe that the, that the sons of God were the godly line of Seth. Uh, others believe that, that they were, as they studied the sons of God in the scriptures all the way through, they believed that they were 
angels or the in this case fallen angels that had left their first estate which we're going to talk about and we're going to we're going to break it down systematically and scripturally through the bible in order for us to remember these now when it's review for some people that's fine but you can also when people say man you guys are you guys are kind of nutty to believe that kind of stuff well people will always say that about the scriptures if you believe things like by the way like geocentricity if you believe uh, the the doctrine of geocentricity well you're automatically a nut then there's something wrong with you i mean don't you know science right and that's what they'll say because really uh, by the way this sons of God daughters of men and the Giants all defy evolution all of those do the reason why they're they are hated and looked about on like that as and by the way guys like Ken Ham and other guys like that they just answers in Genesis those guys just can't hang with these type of teachings they have to explain away a lot of those things right. the reason why is because they're afraid to be embarrassed they don't want people to be, they don't want people to think they're that weird, right? They just don't want, they don't want them to think they're that, they don't want to lose credibility, right? Like if you talk about these doctors, you're going to lose credibility. Well, if it's Bible and you don't believe it, I don't, I'm not the one with the credibility issue, it's you. I believe what God's word says, right? So we have to find out who these sons of God were. Defining them is the key for us to understand the lessons that God has for us here. So we're going to look at every reference. Now think about Methuselah. He was the oldest man to ever live. And many believe his name means when he is dead, it will come. Right? So many people believe that. They, they, they've you know, debated that kind of and, and everything, which is not that important. But the point is that right a year after he died or a year, right, the year of his death, in comes the flood. Right? See... Genesis chapter 1 to 11 are probably the most disputed, argued about, attacked bo uh, books and chapters and verses of the scriptures. Why? Because they're the foundations. Right. Remember when I taught you about the foundations a few years ago? We talked about some of those things. Well, those books are attacked more because if those are true, they are the basis for everything that we believe about right. God. Right. Because God told us, if I can't believe God's, God's history, if I can't believe God's account of how creation happened in this world, I'm in trouble. I, why would I believe anything else? I can't believe anything else in the book if I don't believe what Genesis says. Because every major doctrine of the scriptures is found in the book of Genesis. They all are, right? So, the days of Noah. The Bible, Jesus always takes us back to the days of Noah, always talks to us about the days of Noah. He, when, when, he, when he gave his sermons, when he preached, he went back as in, the, as in the days of Noah, that there were some things that were going on there. And that's why I want to cover kind of that again with you. Um, but let's look at some references here. The sons of God. In Job chapter 1, verse number 6, Now there was a day when the sons of God came to present themselves before the Lord, and Satan came also among them. Now I don't know about you, but... There are some people that have an interpretation of this verse that, well, this is just a day that people on earth were praying, and then Satan went, came and he prayed with them. Or he, he came to talk to God while they were praying. Nowhere in the scriptures do I find when I'm praying to God, Satan accompanies my prayers while, I, while I'm there with God. Nowhere in the Bible does it say that. They've basically made that up. But let's keep reading these, th this section. Right? It says, and, and, and before the Lord, and Satan came also among them. And the Lord said to Satan, Whence comest thou? Then Satan answered the Lord and said, From going to and fro in the earth, and from walking up and down in it. From. Right? From. Where, what does that mean? Yep. It means that he wasn't in the earth. He was right. up there in heaven. Right. He was up there at the throne of God. He was talking to God. What do I believe this is? I believe that when the sons of God reported to God, that's what it says. Look at what it right. says here. It says, when the sons of God came to present themselves, you know, you know, kind of like if you have something that you're in charge of, which we're going to get to, you're going to present yourself to your manager or your leader, and you're going to give an account. You're going to give a report, right, of what you're doing. That's what they were doing. They were presenting themselves before God. You and I, in that sense, don't bodily present ourselves before God. No man presents themselves before God in that sense, bodily, right? These did. They came up and they presented themselves before God. And the Lord said to Satan, Hast thou considered my servant Job, that there is none like him in the earth? In the earth, 
Notice that, in the earth. So he's talking about what's going on in earth, because he's not in earth. He's up there talking to God. Right? And a perfect and upright man, one that feareth God and escheweth evil. May that be said about you and I. Amen? That you and I are those, type, those people. Right? They were in heaven. That was the best picture I could do. I just wanted to... I thought that looks nice. Right? Peter's not, not hanging on the gate, so that you're good. One day. Amen? One day we'll know what it looks like with our own eyes. Amen? Won't that be a blessing? It will be. Because the Lord is the light thereof, right? Amen? Can't get any brighter than Jesus Christ. Amen? Remember, God wrote the book. So he's saying something happened here that was not normal, right? Now, what I want you to remember and understand is there are powers in the heavens. I just did a Bible study on this myself in my own personal Bible study. No man can see God and live. Let's, we know that, right? Because the Bible tells us over and over again. No man in his flesh can see God and live like that. Right. No man can ascend into heaven. No man except Jesus Christ, who is God in the flesh, ascended into heaven himself, right? God sent a chariot for one, yep. right? Enoch was not, for God took him. Yep. God took him, but Jesus ascended to heaven himself. And no man can do that, right? Nowhere in Scripture does it illustrate to us or show us that the godly line of Seth met with God and Satan came along with them. But the Bible does speak of an authority structure in the heavens. Ephesians chapter 6, we're, we're told some things. Finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. Now, stop there for a second. Let me ask you a question. Do you really believe that? Do you believe that, that you wrestle devils as a Christian? If you're a Christian here today, you're a born-again believer, you understand that there's some spiritual wrestling going on. Right. You, you better understand that. This isn't written as hyperbole. This isn't, some, this isn't some allegory from Augustine's perverted box of treasures, okay? This is the scriptures. This is what God said. He said this very plainly, Finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. Put on the whole armor of God. You better, you better understand, you got enemies. And you can't see your enemies. That's what God is telling you here. You think your enemies is flesh and blood. You and I think all the time that our enemies are just, oh, they're just flesh and blood. I mean, my boss doesn't like me, and my dog hates me, and all this other stuff, right? Like a bad country song, right? But the point is, is that, no, your real enemies, you don't see. It's the spirit behind the people. See, you just think, well, they're just, you know, no, they're being led. They're pagans, right? Right? And they're being led by the devil. Just like you, Lord willing, believe that you're led by the Spirit of God. Right. Then you have to believe they're led. And you wonder, why do these people hate me? Remember what we talked about? Don't wonder. Jesus said, marvel not. I don't know why you're so... Jesus said, why, are you, why do you wonder so much about that? Right. You're a son of God. Of course they hate you. You're a daughter of the king. Of course they hate you. Right. Why would they like you? You won't go about their same riotous living. Right. Right? So why would they? Okay. But he says here, for we wrestle not. There's, there's a reason why. He says, we wrestle not against flesh and blood. But against principalities. This is an order. This is an order in the heavens. Do you understand that? How do you know that, preacher? You're, you're making that up again. It's probably just, all it is is just like governors and presidents. It's like George Bush and it's like Obama. And it's like, no, it's not. Those guys are peons. The greatest dictators of this world are nothing but peons in God's sight. They are nothing to him. Right? God can literally think them out of existence. He can throw them in the pit of hell while they're, while they're shaking their fist at him in heaven. Right? Gone. Dead. Th that's not what he's talking about here. He says we wrestle not against flesh and blood. He's telling you about a kingdom that's not of this world. He says, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. 
right? He's explaining to you an authority structure that's there. You believe that, right? Like you believe that, like God's telling, by the way, you know Ephesians is written to a church? You knew that, right? Like, we knew that, didn't we? <laughs> so what's he saying? He said, church, you're, you, you're battling not only the world, the flesh, but the devil and his kingdom. You're, you're in a war. And the church, by the way, you and I individually are supposed to have our armor on, but the church, we together as a body, right? We're a body. We're supposed to have the armor on. We're supposed to wear that armor together, right? To go out in battle. Uh, that's why we're an example, right? To the, to the angels, right? And to the principalities that are there. That word principalities, it's dealing with, it's dealing with an authority structure. That power is authority. Powers, right? Right, the Bible talks about obey them that have the rule over you, right? The powers that be are ordained of God, right? Well, this is talking about spiritual powers. This is like, this is like what it looks like when you're, when you're praying, I think, sometimes. <laughs> I, think, I think what you and I don't realize, what you and I don't realize is there's a war going on when you and I pray. Why do you think it's so difficult for you to pray? Why do you think, it's, you, you stand around sometimes and you're like, I don't understand why it's so hard for me to pray. I don't, you don't? Well, it's a war. Prayer is warfare. It's battle. And in the heavenlies, there's all kinds of things going on when you're praying. There's, there's a war going on. You believe that, don't you? Well, look at Daniel chapter 10. Let's prove it. I'm going somewhere with this. I'm setting, I'm setting it up here. But I like all this extra stuff that I'm adding in there because it's, it's kind of convicting. It, 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 it really is. There's some good spiritual lessons here for us. Daniel chapter 10, verse number 12. Then said he unto me, Fear not, Daniel, for from the first day that thou didst set thine heart to understand and to chasten thyself before thy God, thy words were heard, and I am come for thy words. But the prince of the kingdom of Persia. Now there it is. Remember that principalities? Remember that? There's, right? Oh, that was just Old Testament times. That was not, that's not, that was like that prophet Daniel. That's not you and I. I mean, we would, surely there wouldn't be anything that would, that uh, Satan would not want to hinder our prayers, right? There wouldn't be any of that going on, right? But the prince of the kingdom of Persia withstood me one in 20 days. But lo, Michael, one of the chief princes, came to help me, and I remained there with the kings of Persia. He's talking about in the spirit. He's talking about spiritual warfare. He's talking about a battle. This isn't being spooky. This is just being biblical. I'm just, I'm just reading you what the Bible says. I'm reading you exactly what the text says and what the, the, the application of that. So, so Job speaks of those sons of God that present themselves. Then a second time, Job talks about that. In Job chapter 2, verse number 1, or not Job, but, but God does here. Again, there was a day when the sons of God came to present themselves before the Lord. And Satan came also among them to present himself before the Lord. At this time, Satan was still required to present himself before God. Is that the case now? I'm not sure. People dispute Revelation 12 as far as when he's cast out of heaven and all those things like that when he will be cast down. And the Lord said to Satan, from whence comest thou? And Satan answered the Lord and said, from going to and fro in the earth and from walking up and down in it. Again, he's not there. He's in the heavens. He's just telling you, like I was running around causing trouble, God. That's what I was doing. I was just running around seeing who I could tempt, seeing who I could. Oh, well, now did God ask him that about Job? Because God didn't know. He, did, he was curious what Satan was thinking. Or did he ask him that because he knew full well that Job was attacking, or that Satan was attacking Job? He knew full well that Satan was attacking Job. That's why he asked him, what have you been up to? Right? Every time God asks a question, he just wants man to confess. He's not, it's not that he doesn't know it. He just wants you to say it with your own mouth. Right. You know, and he wants you to tell the truth. He wants you to be able to say it. God already knows the answer to that. Right? And the Lord said to Satan, hast thou considered my servant Job? that there is none like him in the earth, a perfect and upright man, one that feareth God and escheweth evil, and still he, he holdeth fast his integrity, although thou movest me against him to destroy him without cause. Now, here it is. Look at that phrase. There it is. When the sons of God came to present themselves. 
and Satan came along, along with them, right? So you have, you have another reference. Those are angels. Plain and simple. You can't get around it. The Bible talks about the different bodies, right? In 1 Corinthians 15, 40, there are also celestial bodies and bodies terrestrial. But the glory of the celestial is one, and the glory of the terrestrial is another. Two different types of bodies there are mentioned, right? There's a difference. There's a difference in those bodies for a purpose and a reason. We'll talk about that at the end today when we talk about the resurrected body a little bit and the differences there and how they're likened unto angels and things like that. Now, Job 38. Job 38, verse 4. Right? Where wast thou when I laid the foundations of the earth? I like these questions that God asks Job. Man, I'll tell you what, there may not be a man on earth when you're walking with God and you're living for God that can humble you or accuse you. There wasn't, I mean, they, they, they all threw their accusations against Job, but none of them could stick, right? Some of the things they said were very good things. They just misapplied them to Job's situation. They're very good things, his friends, some of the things that they said to him. However, here what we find is that God can humble Job. See, God's able to humble his men, his, his, his children, when nobody else can. And he doesn't want them to. He wants, he wants to do it. He said, where was thou when I laid the foundations of the earth? Declare if thou hast understanding. That's humbling, isn't it? By the way, that's the same question, type of question that God asks you when you question God's will or when you question God's way for your life or you question what God is doing. That same thing. God says that same thing to you. He says, who hath laid the measures thereof, if thou knowest, or who hath stretched the line upon it? Whereupon are the foundations thereof fastened? Or who laid the cornerstone thereof? Did you do it? Were you there? Did you see it? Job, you're a man. Did you see these things? Well, that's an important comparison. Why? Because it shows you that the sons of God were not men. They were angels. When the morning stars sang together and all the sons of God shouted for joy. Again, no man was there to see that. Man was created on the sixth day, right? Man wasn't there to see this. We know the Bible speaks of the fourth day or, or so sometime around there where, where, where the angels were created. When the morning stars sang together and all the sons of God shouted for joy. Think about that. No man was there. When people try to teach that the sons of God were, were just the godly line of Seth, when you do a, a study throughout the scriptures on the sons of God, especially in the Old Testament where the references are, and what the, by the way, the context is king. Wherever the context is, whatever the context of the conversation is or whatever God is saying in the scriptures, you look at the entire context of what he's talking about. Morning stars are the sons of God. I like this verse, Revelation 1.20. The mystery of the seven stars, which thou sawest in my right hand, and the seven golden candlesticks. The seven stars are the angels of the seven churches, and the seven candlesticks which thou sawest are the seven churches. Now, whatever, whatever you believe about this, as far as messengers, that, that's angels are messengers as well. But look what it says here. It talks about the stars. And it talks about angels, the stars and angels. Right. There's a comparison there that is given. That comparison, and, and, and there's, by the way, this is a built, this is the King James Bible's built-in encyclopedia. Amen. You see that? When, when God gives you something, a symbol, the mystery of the seven stars, he says, you don't know what they are, do you? Well, let me explain to you what they are. That's what God's saying there. By the way, when he does that, he always gives us the interpretation of it. So, he, so if he's speaking in an allegory or, or um, hyperbole or something like that, when he's speaking like that, he gives you the definition. He explains to you why he's likening it to that. He says the morning stars, they're the angels, right? He's, he's explaining to you what he's doing, right? So you're not confused about that. So then when somebody tries to allegorize the text when it's not, when it's not supposed to be, the built-in built encyclopedia or dictionary explains exactly what it's supposed to say. 
and what you're supposed to believe about it. So here it says the mystery of the seven stars, which thou sawest in my right hand. So they're the stars and the seven golden candlesticks. He tells you what he's doing. The pictures that he's making, he said the seven stars are the angels of the seven churches. Right? Then he says the seven candlesticks are the seven churches. So you just see how he built that in? See how he explained that to you there? By the way, you can do that too when you study scripture. You ought to do that. God gave you the Holy Ghost and he gave you this King James Bible for you to do that and you ought to be able to do that. This is like a picture of that in heaven, right? Where these sons of God and these morning stars where they're shouting for joy, right? When they see the power of God. One day you and I are going to do that when we stand before the throne of God. We're going to be like those angels in that sense. The Bible tells us that. We'll talk about that later. But we're going to be in heaven shouting. You notice how I purposely didn't put an image of God there. Because I don't believe in doing that. The Bible says not to. So I did my best in all these um, not to put any images of God. But the Bible talks about the fire. It talks about the things, the light around the throne and things like that. But not an image, right? You, won't, you, you shouldn't see in here any long-haired hippie Jesus. Uh, I, I don't think I have any of those in there. Um, if I do, it would be to show you that that's not Jesus. <laughs> but, right? That's, that's why. That's, that's why. Um, but anyway, you see the sons of God and how they shouted for joy, right? Satan's goal. Why did Satan do this? What was his goal? What did he have in mind, right? What, why did he instigate this? Well, there's a reason for that. It said, Isaiah chapter 14 speaks to us about why, what Satan's goal was, okay? Lucifer. For thou, in Isaiah 14, 13, For thou hast said in thine heart, I will ascend into heaven. I will exalt my throne above the stars of God. Wait. What is that? Two things. The stars, right? The actual stars that are out there, which I do not believe are the same thing. I do not believe those things that, that I look at at night when I walk down my driveway are angels. No, they're pictures. He explains that they're pictures. Those aren't angels up there sitting in the heavens. I don't believe that. Um, are there angels in the heavens? Yeah, but you can't see them. You ain't going to see those angels. You can't see. You can't. You're not going to see them unless God brings, God would send one to you for some reason. And if you're starting to see some angels, we might have to have some talks. <laughs> What's that? That's right, unawares. You see what he said? We don't know it. And then afterwards, you're like, man, what was that? Unawares, right? But anyway, so it says here, For thou hast said in thine heart, I will ascend into heaven. I will exalt my throne above the stars of God. Well, he was a, he wanted, Satan said he will exalt his throne. And he has a throne, by the way. It says it right there. He has a throne in the heavens. But he will ascend, right? He will exalt above the stars of God. I will sit upon the mount of the congregation in the sides of the north. I will ascend above the heights of the clouds. I will be like the Most High. Those stars of God, both. He wants to exalt all, all of himself, but above those angels, those sons of God, that he would be on the top of the food chain, so to speak, right? That he would rule those that have fell right? That he would do that. But again, you see stars, you see sons of God, you see the same connection through to that, right? This is what Satan's goal has been. This is why he would do what he was going to do. And, and there's more to come with that. Uh, let's see, Revelation 12, 4. And his tail drew the third part of the stars of heaven and did cast them to the earth. And the dragon stood before the woman, which was ready to be delivered for to devour her child as soon as it was born. Okay, now, are you ready for this? Remember I told you about the built-in dictionary? The built-in encyclopedia, right? You wonder what something means? Well, here it is. This is telling you what it means. And his tail drew the third part of the stars of heaven and did cast them to the earth. Well, what does that mean? And the dragon stood before the woman which was ready to be delivered for to devour her child as soon as it was born. Revelation 12, 9. And that great dragon was cast out. Well, who's the great dragon? How do we know who that is? That old serpent. Amen. Well, who's that? He's explained it to you. The, called the devil right. and Satan. Well, there you go. Where's the old serpent? 
Genesis chapter 3, that's the old serpent. Right? He's the dragon. Satan is the dragon. But who are the stars? Who are the stars? He's explaining to you who the stars are. Right? Who are they? He was cast out of the earth and his angels were cast out with him. They are. They are. He's telling you that he's explaining that these stars that he's speaking of, right, are those morning stars that sang and all the sons of God shouted for joy. Those are the fallen ones. And this is what's happening in verse 4 is being explained in verse 9. He, I mean, he's telling you plainly what that is. So you're not confused about that, right? About the picture or the typology or the emblem that he's using to describe them. Satan is that old serpent, right? And boy, is he, right? Desiring to deceive the masses, right? Think about what the Bible says here. When we look at, these, when we look at the text here and we look at what's being described here, it's very plain, very easy that God didn't want you to be confused about it. He wanted you to understand it very plainly and simply. God's word is not, is, is not meant to be complicated for his people, right? Not meant to be. These are those fallen angels, right? A picture of them. They're not them, obviously, but the, the falling from heaven, right? Falling, leaving their first estate in their own habitation, right? Leaving there. What does habitation mean? Well, where do you, where's your habitat at, right? Yeah, where do you reside? Where do you live? Where's your, where's your own estate? It's what God's given you, Amen. right? Where, where, when you go home, that's your estate, right? People say, well, that's why they, they get a problem with the, the church in, in, in so-and-so's house. And they say, well, you can't have a meeting house like this because you have to have it in a house. Well, a house technically was your estate. It was everything that you own. When it says Pharaoh's house, it didn't mean that, that actually just Pharaoh's house, that he dwelt in. It meant his entire estate, right? That's what it meant. But people get confused sometimes. But we know that Satan fell, and after he fell, he had a plan. And what was, the, what was the design of that plan, right? The design of that plan was to confuse. The design of that plan was to mingle the seed, which we're going to get to. That was his plan. But let's look at Romans chapter 8. Let's go to some New Testament references. Because some people say, well, when you get to the New Testament, there are some things there that, that could be questionable as far as the sons of God go. And not really. But if you, if you just explain them in the context in which they're given, the Bible explains a lot to us um, right there in the context. Romans 8, 19, For the earnest expectation of the creature waiteth for the manifestation of the sons of God. That's us. He's talking about us, what we will be, right? One day. You and I, we groan and travail in this body, right? We're subject to vanity right now. We don't have the body that we're going to have one day. You know, when you wake up in the morning and your back hurts, maybe some of you don't have that yet, but hang on, you will. Uh, your, your body's in pain and you have different things going wrong. Uh, you got to wear glasses, right? Because your eyes start failing you. Uh, all those other things that you have to do, health things you have, you got to get a surgery on your back or you got to do all those other things, right? That's this flesh. One day when we see Christ, our bodies are going to be made new. And they're going to be made like his. And that's that post-resurrection body. That's the one that Jesus had when he rose from the dead. We're going to have a body just like that. Like the angels in heaven that have the same body. Right? Philippians 2.15. That you may be blameless and harmless. The sons of God without rebuke in the midst of a crooked and perverse nation. Among whom you shine as lights in the world. Now in the New Testament... Why is, this, why is this important? Why does this matter? Well, because in the New Testament, this is before Jesus. Uh, in the Old Testament, Jesus had not come. We are made sons of God by faith in Christ Jesus. Jesus made the angels. When he created them, he made them, and they were called the sons of God. Adam, when God created him, was called the son of God. Why? Because God was his father. God created him. Right? You, when you get saved by the grace of God, you are called a son of God. You are a son of God. Right? Why? Because you were regenerated 
born again from above, right? Born from above, born again, regenerated into the family of God. This is what the scriptures talk about in the New Testament. That wasn't the case in the Old Testament like that. It wasn't until Jesus rose from the dead, until Jesus came, right? 1 John 3, 2 talks about that. Beloved, now are we the sons of God. You and I. Now, by the way, you can know that. You can be saved by the grace of God. Have your sins forgiven you. Brother, now are we, beloved, now are we the sons of God. And it doth not yet appear what we shall be. But we know, I like John's book. He talks about that over again. But we know, study, I studied that one time. We know, we know, we know. Amen? We know. Amen. That's the Bible, friend. We know. You know what's not there? We feel. We feel. We feel. Yeah. Or we think, right? No. It's we know. Amen. Why? How do we know from this, God's Spirit, and this Word? Man. What you know will trump everything you feel. Or if you're not walking in the Spirit, what you feel will attempt to trump everything you know. Those things are not the same. They are not always the same. Amen. Thank God you don't have to feel it. You got to believe it. Amen. <laughs> Woo, this flesh don't feel nothing but hell sometimes. Right? Amen. The Bible says your tongue is it's set on the fires of hell. Right? Beloved, now are we the sons of God. It doth not yet appear what we shall be. But we know that when he shall appear, we shall be like him. For we shall see him as he is. One day, amen, Revelation twenty two sixteen, I, Jesus, have sent mine angel to testify unto you these things in the churches. I am the root. He's the root, amen. I like that. Think about that for a second. He's the root, right? When you got saved, the Holy Spirit of God comes inside of you, right? And that seed falls in there, digs down deep, and makes its roots. And then eventually, as time goes by and you serve the Lord, it springs up. It grows. Deep roots. Deep. Amen? Deep roots. I, Jesus, have sent mine angel to testify unto you these things in the churches. I am the root and the offspring of David and the bright, look at that, and morning star. See, you can't, you, you have to willfully deny these scriptures when you go through there of what the Bible is illustrating here. You know what I mean? You have to. Now, here's the argument that comes up. People say, well, Jesus talked about uh, angels and Jesus talked about some of these things and you know it doesn't seem like uh, that that that's that that's applicable right because Jesus said angels in heaven uh, don't marry well that's the key phrase right there that's the key you know every you believe in every word Bible right right Matthew 22 let's look what it says here Matthew 22 verse number 28 therefore that Jesus was asked a question uh, if a lady has, you know, seven husbands, seven brothers, right? One dies, the next die, the next die. In the resurrection, who's she married to? They were trying to stump him. They were trying to stump Jesus. And Jesus, he said, you do err not knowing the scriptures, right? Ba basically, in modern day terms, he was like, you don't even know what you're talking about. I mean, your question has, it has no biblical basis at all, right? It's not even practical. It's not logical. Why is that? Because they did err not knowing the scriptures. Matthew twenty two twenty eight. Therefore, in the resurrection, whose wife shall, shall she be of the seven? For they all had her. Jesus answered and said to them, you do err not knowing the scriptures, nor the power of God. For in the resurrection, they neither marry nor are given in marriage, but are as the angels of God in heaven. 
They are as the angels of God. Now, we're going to explain that more later, okay, uh, this afternoon. We're going to explain that to you. But Jesus is telling them that you don't understand. Those angels in heaven, they don't need to get married. Like, they don't, they don't have that desire. The fallen ones did. So can you explain that? Nope. I can't explain why you and I do the things we do. depravity and rebellion yep. right but anyway he talked about that and he explained that that those that those angels in heaven don't do that but we're we'll, we'll get into that later on john chapter 1 verse number 12 but as many as received him by the way that's you and i if you've been saved to them gave he power man that's power you believe that don't you oh i do i do because i know what i was like before i was saved I know what I was, a child of the devil, a depraved man, given over to my passions and my desires. And then Jesus saved my soul, and there's a fight there. There's a fight against evil. There's a hatred of evil. Amen? There's a desire to follow Christ and to obey him in all things. Right? Why? Because to them gave he power. You believe that, don't you? Power. By the way, that word is like a, it's like dynamite. It's, it means dynamite. That's what it means. That, I remember a preacher, man, when I first got saved, there was this preacher, my, my pastor, this old cassette tape, and he played it for me. We were driving around. We were, we were going uh, uh, soul winning. We were out soul winning, knocking doors and, and visiting people. And we were together, him and I, and he played this sermon about, and this preacher was talking about the Holy Ghost blasting things out of your life. You know, the Holy Ghost is like dynamite. You know, the power that he gives us, right? And look what he says here. To, to, but as many as received him, to them gave he power. I'm going to tell you what, if you lack any power, it's because you're not going to the power source. And that's the reason why. Amen. Come on now. I want you to think about that for a second. The Bible says, but as many as received him, to them gave he power. That's all of us. And I know, I know from the word of God, the authority, right? And we know, right? I know that from the word of God, right? I don't just think that. No, I know it. I'm telling you what, there's a lot of things I've doubted about myself in, four or five, in the last four or five years of my life when I've been through all kinds of things. But the one thing that I couldn't doubt is everything that he said in that book was true. Oh, man, I'm the Lord, I know what you said is true. I believe it. I can't feel it, God. I can't feel anything right now. I feel like if somebody stuck me with something, not now, but I mean then, <laughs> if somebody stuck me with something, it'd be numb and I wouldn't feel a thing. I didn't feel anything. But I knew. I knew, right? Amen. But as many as received him to them gave he power to become the sons of God, even them that believe on his name. That's powerful, friend. That's powerful. That's the gospel, right? So when somebody says, well, that's not receiving Jesus in your heart is not. Well, you might, you might be straining at a gnat there, maybe. Because it says here, but as many as received him to them gave he power to become the sons of God. You might, you might be straining at a gnat. Yeah, well, they didn't get saved the way I did. Well, everybody gets saved the same way. Repentance toward God Amen. and faith toward our Lord Jesus on, Christ. Preacher. There may be some circumstances around it that are different, but you and I aren't the, aren't the measuring stick Christ is. And by the way, when you study testimonies in the Scriptures, you see a lot of different ones. They're not all the same. Some people came to Christ after years and years and years and years. Some people came to Christ. Some people came to Christ right away when they first heard the gospel or soon on. Some came as children. Some came when they were older. Right? But all through the blood. But all through the blood. That's Amen. right. It's Jesus that saves. Amen. Remember that. Which were born, not of blood, nor the will of the flesh, nor the will of man, but of God. Amen. That's why salvation isn't held in some man's hand today. It's Christ. Amen. Christ died for sinners. And he was buried and he rose again from the dead. You know, context is important. And everything that we study about this subject with the sons of God and who they are. It's important. In anything you do when you're studying the scriptures, you've got to contextually study and you've got to do an inductive study through the scriptures of something. There, I don't care what group it is. If you come at the scriptures with your own system in mind at times, by the way, that's why I don't fit perfectly in most of their systems. I don't, 
I don't fit with the Calvinists. I don't fit with the Armenians. I don't. I don't fit. I don't fit with the uh, the Briders. I don't. I don't fit with the with with, uh, with many of the dispensationalists. Although I agree with a lot of what they say. I don't agree. I don't fit with some of the covenant, uh, the Baptist covenant theologians and some of the things they. I do believe some of the things they believe. I do believe some of the things the Briders believe. I do believe some of the things the dispensationalists believe. I just don't come at the scriptures. You know why? Because no one trained me that I had to follow that hey, system. Guys, come on. No one taught me that you have to, if you don't follow this, then you're going to be, you're not right with God. I've been called a heretic for a thousand different things. But if it's in the Bible, then say on, brother, say Amen. on. It's fine. But the point is, is that you have to contextually look at that and say, well, does it fit the context? And it does it, does it disagree with any other major doctrines in the scriptures? That's what you have to do when you study any subject like that. It's very important. We must not deviate from the context of scriptures. Plainly, we can see each classification of the scriptures. And I'm going to show you that. Only someone trying to do some mental gymnastics, you know, when they're trying to get around something because they don't want to be embarrassed by something. I can't come out and believe that. It's just like geocentricity. I can't come out and believe that. I mean, if I believe that, they're going to think I'm nuts. They're going to think I deny science. They're going to think I'm a flat earther. Right? That's how it is. So people don't want to, they don't want to, they don't want to believe these things. They're afraid to believe these things. Some people are. You know, when someone's not comfortable with the scriptures, they try to make another interpretation. <laughs> that's, what, that's what they do. Because they, they have to explain that, you know, there's some things that people don't want to teach their congregations because then they have to actually teach them all the way through. They have to explain to them, like I'm doing. You take time and you, and you, you slow down and you teach through it. Right? There's some things you have, like modesty. How many weeks were we on that? I taught hours on that, but I did, we did it for how many weeks? Oh, man, I want to say, was it a month or two maybe or something like that? Of Sunday afternoons, I taught for an hour to two hours at a time through modesty. Because I didn't want to just say to you what a lot of Baptist pastors say. Well, here's our dress code. Right. Here's what we believe. Sign here. You're supposed to wear these two inches below the knees. This is our dress code. No, I didn't do that to you. Amen. By the way, I never had a dress code here. Right? Because I, I believe in modesty. That's a scriptural principle. Right. right? Now, if you came in looking like a harlot, we'd be like, you need to go home. Because <laughs> this ain't, you, I'll preach to you on the street, and you could look like a harlot out there if you choose, but you can't look like one of those in here. Because I got young boys here, I got young men here, and I got older men here. Right? So that, that, that's not going to happen. But that's, that's different than just a disagreement about a piece of clothing or whatever. You know what I mean? What I'm saying to you is that I taught you specifically through those things. Because it's uncomfortable and a lot of women don't like it and they get mad and they leave. Because they don't like it. And a lot of their husbands can't, they're afraid to stand up to them and tell them the truth. And you, yes, and I, I, taught, you about mixed, I taught you about mixed fibers too. Which Lee's definitely guilty of. Because probably the hot dogs that he eats are mixed fibers. I don't know. Those are not of this world. Those are alien. There's, there's no fiber in those hot dogs. All right, let's look at this. Three classifications for the sons of God. All right? Adam. Luke 3.38. Right? Adam. Adam. Was called, the, uh, was called the son of God, right? Look at this. Which was the son of Enos, which was the son of Seth, which was the son of Adam, which was the son of God. So there you go. Yep. Adam was called the son of God. Why? Because God created him. Right. right? God made Adam. He formed him out of the dust of the ground, breathed into his nostrils the breath of, of the dust of the ground, breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and man became a living, living soul. When you got saved, right? I'll get to that in a second. The angels, number two, the second one. Genesis 6 and other places in the Old Testament speak of the stars and the sons of God and the morning stars. That's a classification, right? And why? Because God made the angels, right? And, and he called them sons of God. That's what he called them. Why? Because he made them. He's the father of his creation. Right. God is the father. In that sense, God is the father of all men. Not in a covenant sense. Not in salvation by, by grace through faith. That's a different one. We're adopted sons of God, right? When we get saved. But God is the father of all creation. That's why you're to love your neighbor as yourself. That's why you're to love your enemies. 
Right? That's why you're not supposed to kill people, right? That's why. Why? Because they were made in the image of God. God made them, and God is their father. So in that sense, there's nothing, there's nothing wrong with saying that, as long as you explain that God is the father of creation. There's no, that's not sinful. That's not wrong to say. Right? And that's not teaching a universal salvation because they have to be born again. Why? Because they fell. They're totally depraved and they fell into sin. And they have a fallen nature. Right? But God's original intent was to create man. Right? And he is the father of all that he created. Right? Just like if someone makes something, uh, they're, they're, they fathered that in that sense. Right? Same, same, same example there of that. Uh, Christians are adopted into the family of God by redemption through Christ. Romans chapter 8. Turn there. Romans chapter 8. I don't know if I put that in there. I didn't, did I? Okay. Romans chapter 8. Let's go there. Amen. You know what? You're getting a teaching on the sons of God here, but you're also getting some practical doctrinal lessons here that are very good. You know, the, the Lord's changed me over the last three or four years, though, and he's taught me some things about, you know, there's things that you can teach people and you can, you know, you can expand on that and help them to grow by little things. It doesn't always have to be big things here. And I like mixing it up a little bit. That's why I want to teach you some of these PowerPoints here for a few weeks. And I just felt led of the Lord to do that where I was at in Joshua. I just, the Lord wanted me, I knew that God didn't want me to keep going. I just knew it for some reason that God didn't want me to keep going at that time. I was going to stop there and do something else for a while. And, um, you know, there's nothing wrong with that. Amen. Uh, Romans chapter 8, verse number 14. For we know that the law is spiritual, but I am carnal. Oops, that's the wrong one, but that's a good one too. That was 7. Uh, Romans 8, 14. For as many as are led by the Spirit of God, they are the sons of God. For you have not received the spirit of bondage again to fear, but you have received the spirit of adoption, whereby we cry, Abba, Father. Amen. I like that, don't you? The Spirit itself bears witness with our spirit that we are the children of God. By the way, you notice in the context of what he's talking about, it's when you're in trouble. <laughs> you see that, right? When you're in trouble, he said, that's when the Spirit bears witness with our spirit. When you're crying out to God, oh God, you got to help me. Yeah. That's, that's when, when trouble comes. Right? When you're afraid. When you're in fear. That's when you got to, that's when you got to turn to the Lord. Right? And if children, then heirs, heirs of God and join heirs with Christ. If so be that we suffer with him. We may be also glorified together. Amen? That's good stuff, isn't it? So Christians are adopted in the family of God. When we get saved by the grace of God, the Holy Ghost of God comes inside of us. He seals us under the day of redemption. Jesus pictured that when he breathed on his disciples and said, Receive ye the Holy Ghost. Right? That's a picture of that as well. That's that regeneration. When you are regenerated, you are born again. You are given genes from above. Right? You are made in the image of Christ. Amen? When you get saved, you're, you're made in the image of Christ. You're, you're, you're born again. You're born again, made in the image of God, and then you're given His Spirit. And with that Spirit, when trouble comes and trials come, you cry out, Abba, Father. Amen. And some of you might be too stubborn to cry out, Abba, Father, when you're in trouble. Some of you might be cold-hearted a little bit. When you get into trouble, you dig a little bit deeper into your trouble, and you're not crying out to God. You're expecting things to go status quo, everything to go the same. And, hey, I, there doesn't have to be a time when I really, truly have to cry out to God and, and, and hang on every, every bit of God's Word and all the prayer time and everything else. Well, I'm sorry, friend. There is going to come a time for that, and you need it in your life, that you're going to have to do that. And this is the, these times that we're facing here, I'm seeing men's hearts fail. And Brother Scott telling me about... Um, his uh, ex ex wife's husband. He didn't even know it. Committed suicide for for uh, uh, three months ago. September. September. He didn't even know about it, and he knew the man before. Men's hearts failing them for fear. Right? You say that scares me just thinking about that. Good. Take it to Christ. Good. Take it to Christ. Amen. I'm going to tell you what, I got the answer for you right here in this book. 
He says when you're in that fear, when, when you're in that, when you have, if you want his spirit to bear witness with your spirit, then you cry out, Abba, Father. What time I am afraid, I will trust in thee. I know it to be true, friend. I know it. Keep your eyes on Jesus. That's right. You want, you want to go down deeper? Just keep looking at yourself. Man, you'll hit so low. Yeah, you will. That's right. You keep your eyes on yourself, you'll end up wanting to die too. You can't do that, friend. You can't do that. Mm -mm -mm -mm. Right? And then we have Jesus Christ as the eternal Son of God. We're made in His image. So we are the sons of God. What do you think those angels, how they were created in that sense? They always come as what? Who knows how angels always appear? Lucius. As men. They always appear as men. Why? Christ is a man. Amen. Christ is a man. He's the God-man, Christ Jesus. Why did they, why do they appear as a man? Right? Right. Right. No, no, no. The signs and wonders are to come when Jesus comes. Right. And he's going to show we're not looking for angels and we're not looking for all the what's that? No, we're not looking for flaming angels and swords that say conquer. We're not we're not tending not to look for that. Two of them. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, I believe so, yes. I don't have the reference in front of me. I will have it the next hour, though, because I'm going to talk about them. But No, that's okay. You just gave a sneak peek. That's okay. It's okay. We'll, we'll just charge double for the admission for the next, next one. Andrew, did you get our pay-per-view online taken care of there? Okay. Is everybody dialed in? Okay. Daniel chapter 3, let's go there. Did I put that in there? I don't think I did. did. Yes. Okay. All right, good deal. All right. Let me get to Daniel here. Daniel chapter 3, verse number 25. I like this. Verse number 24 says, and Then Nebuchadnezzar the king was astonished and rose up in haste and spake. And said unto his counselors, Did not we cast three men bound in the midst of the fire? They answered and said unto the king, True, O king. He answered and said, Lo, I see four men loose, walking in the midst of the fire, and they have no hurt. And the form of the fourth is like the Son of God. Amen. That's the capital Son of God. Yeah. Amen. Amen? Yep. Amen? That's Jesus in the fire. Amen. Right? I like that. There's some, Ron Hamilton sings a song about Jesus will go walking with you, walking through the fire. That's a good song. Amen. Walking through the fire. Amen. Jesus is with you in the fire. If you ain't seen him, you ain't looking for him. Amen. He's there. He's in the fire. In the fire with you. Right? Now look at what it says here. Like the Son of God. That's the reference. Same thing. Obviously, Jesus, I believe Jesus is the angel of the Lord as well. But no, you'll notice in Scripture, that's capitalized too. Right. Every time you see Jesus Amen. in any form that he comes, a Christophany, anytime he comes and he appears before his, before his birth, his incarnation on this earth, it's always capitalized in whatever he is, right? Because he's a better high priest. He's a better angel. He's a better mediator. He's a better, right? He's always better. Better than Moses, better than, than all of them, amen? The phrase angel is spoken in the text referring to the Son of God. You see what he says here uh, when he talks about that. In verse number, let's see, 20. Then Nebuchadnezzar spake and said, Blessed be the God of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Look at this. Who has sent his angel. So he said his angel, then he said like the Son of God. See that? And delivered his servants that trusted in him and have changed the king's word and yielded their bodies that they might not serve nor worship Amen. any God except their own God. Mm. By the way, my God is still the same God. Amen. This, this whole world is, is gearing up and it's, it's like revving up the machine for the mark of the beast. Yep. 
right? It's revving it up, revving it up, right. working towards it, right? The one world government, right. the one world religion, right? It's already out there. It's already the skeletons in place. It's already filling in. But it's there, right? They're revving up for it. The, like somebody said, do you think the vaccine's the mark of the beast? No. no. I don't. Do you think it's a, do you think it's a, a precursor to it? Yeah. Well, yeah. All of these are tests yep. leading up to that. All of them are, right? Every generation has had their antichrist that arose yeah, right. that tried to take over the world, right? And tried to control the world, right? You got the Pope that's been doing it for thousands of years, Even now. right? Like that, like Pope Benedict, he's over there and uh, he's supposed to be the retired devil, but he's still talking sometimes and he's a stinking nasty pervert. And uh, he says, well, yeah, there were, there were some mistakes with the child pedophilia cases. There, there were some mistakes there, but he didn't do anything wrong. Well, of course not. When you believe he's God in the flesh, of course he couldn't do anything wrong, could he? Right? That's what their doctrine believes. That's what they believe. He's the vicar of Christ, right? So conclusions here on the sons of God. The sons of God in Genesis 6 are clearly fallen angels. They're not human. Right. right? Every Old Testament reference is to angels. Every time the con in the context you see it's to angels. Nowhere in the context do they refer to men in that sense. Sons of God, daughters of men. Right? After Christ's coming, the New Testament refers to Christians as sons of God. Why? Because we're made into His image by His death, burial, and resurrection. We're made into His image, right? So think about this one thing. Your own soul. Have you been made into the image, right? Have you been born again from above? Have you been forgiven of your sins and cleansed of your unrighteousness? Have you been saved by the grace of God? Has there been a time that you repented and put your faith and trust in Jesus Christ? Because I'm going to tell you what, the only way that you can cry out, Abba, Father, the only way you can be forgiven of your sins is through Jesus Christ. The Bible says, but as many as received him. Who? Jesus. As many as received him to them gave he power to become the sons of God even them that believe on his name. That's the gospel. That's the power of the resurrection, right? When the Bible speaks of that power, it's speaking of that resurrection power. Because you know there's the death, and then there's the burial, but then there's the triumphant resurrection, right? There's a dying, there's a burial, and then there's a resurrection. Raised to walk in newness of life. That's what baptism pictures, right? Is someone being saved. It pictures that death, burial, and resurrection. It's a picture of salvation. It's a picture of the gospel. It is our public confession of faith. Baptism is that public confession of faith. It's saying that I identify with Christ. I have been forgiven of my sins. I've been saved by the grace of God. And I want to walk in newness of life. I want to live that resurrected life. That is my desire to live that resurrected life. Amen. Then are you uh, the sons of God. Amen through faith in Christ Jesus, as the Bible talks about. As many as are led by the Spirit of God, they are the sons of God. So that's talking about the new, the new man in Christ, right? But as we go back here, who were the sons of God? I think we understand who they were now. This lays the foundation, the beginning. This afternoon, we're going to talk about what their crimes were and, what God, and how God judged them and the judgment on the, on the sons of God. We're going to cover both of those probably... Uh, later on in the afternoon, we'll have one combined. I think I'll probably do a combined teaching on that, and we'll do the whole thing, uh, two and three together. But hopefully this, this lays the basis for you to understand. Some of you have heard this before. Some of you haven't. But it, it, it lays the scriptural basis down. Then we find out why. And then we're going to talk about why this is so important. It explains so many things about why. Okay, here's, here's one of the questions, and, and we'll, I'm going to close with this, but here's one of the questions that it answers. Well, why did God just tell Israel to go in and wipe all those Canaanites out and wipe all those people out? Well, because there were giants in the earth of those days, and also after that, the sons of God came into the daughters of men. That, that whole Canaan was populated by, which we're not going to talk about this week, but next week, by four angels. Those four angels repopulated those with giants in the land, and there were giants everywhere in that land. Well, look at all the tribes of giants that they fought. They fought the Anakims. They fought the, what were they, the Parasites and the, not Parasites. You've, some of you have fought those before. Those aren't fun. But uh, those Parasites are nasty, aren't they? 
But uh, they're not that big, though, like parasites. But anyway, all those, all those, the Zuzims, is that one of them? Jacob's favorite one? They were redheaded giants, I think. No, I'm just kidding. But uh, the, the Zuzims, right? Well, wait a minute. I thought there was just Goliath after the flood. No, they went into there and they had to wipe out all those giants because there were tribes of them all the way through Canaan. Yeah, and I believe, and I believe four, of those, four of those angels are what populated them. Okay? And I believe those four angels were bound after they did it. They are separate four angels from the pre-flood ones. They are different. But you have to be able to explain that because then people will think, oh, well, God's for just genocide and wiping everybody out. No, he's not. There's a specific reason for why God did what he did there. There was a reason for that. God's not in the business of wiping out whole nations for the fun of it. Right? Right? There was a reason why that happened. Right? So we'll talk about that. Amen? All right. Hope that explains some things. Father in heaven, Lord, thank you for all that you do for us. Thank you for your word. We pray, Lord, that you'd bless it to our hearts. And if there be one or two not saved, Lord, that they would come to Christ today, who is to know life everlasting. Thank you for your blessings. Bless the food and the fellowship, the time we have together. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.